Amen. All right. In, uh, in the last study, um, Romario went over um, the establishing of a prophet. Now, what we're going to look at is what we're going to do is walk through our Bible and see. We're going to use the rule that, that you know, that I, I, I really like using a lot lately. Miller's rule number four, you know, where to understand doctrine, it says to bring the scriptures together on the subject you wish to know. So this is the rule that we're going to take. And does anyone remember the last text of scripture that Romario read before he closed? Anybody? No, the, la the last text that I recall him using before he closed. No. In his notes. No. Isaiah. Uh, what was it? Huh? Isaiah 7, actually. Uh, yes. Isaiah 7. What was it talking about? Isaiah 7. Does anyone remember what he was talking about in Isaiah 7? Huh? What was it? Yes, and what did he say? What did that what does Isaiah seven in regards to what he was talking about say? All right, so what is God gonna do? He's gonna give a sign, right? All right, so keep that in mind. Isaiah is Isaiah fourteen, right? No, fourteen yeah, fourteen, yes. So it says it says the Lord himself. All right? Lord him. Self. Every word is important. So this is a sign God himself gave. It's Genesis 22 and it's John 3.16. For God so loved the world, he gave this sign. And, and that sign is for the whole world. And if the world don't believe this sign, they're going to perish. They're going to die in their sin. Because this is the greatest sign that God himself can give to mankind. Amen? And that sign is, that sign is what's going to establish anybody who receives Christ. Amen. All right. So we just we're going to we're going to come back to that. I just want us to remember that and we're going to go forward now with the thoughts that we had. So I pray that everyone will be able to follow as we go along. But let us go. So we're looking at prophets. Right. And one of the first thing we're going to take a text and we're going to look at Second Peter uh, that we're familiar with. But just jump down to twenty one. It says, for the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by who? So what do we see here about prophets and prophecy? All right. So the spirit is the influence behind these men. So without the spirit, these men have no influence. And if without the Holy Spirit, another spirit is influencing men. So what the Bible is showing us, a person is a prophet based upon the spirit behind him. Y'all follow? Satan is a spirit and then God is a spirit. So which spirit is, is, is influencing the man that's standing before you. Amen? Y'all follow? So that's the first thing we see in regards to a prophet from here. Every prophet is inspired by a spirit. And that's why First John says, try the what? The prophet? Spirit. Try the spirit. Amen? So it's the spirit we got to try, not the man. The man, he looks good outwardly. But who is influencing him? And God's word is given to us so that we can detect the spirit that's influenced a man that's standing before you. He can be the most beautiful, elatorical, nice, genuine man he can be. But if God's spirit is not influencing him, he's a wicked man. Amen. That's what our Bible says. Jesus says false prophets comes how? Sheep's clothing. They speak well. They feed well, they clothe the naked, they kiss babies, they hug people, they help the poor, they help the sick, they build schools, they build churches, but who's influencing them? Satan. Satan, because Satan has a plan, and that's the net he's laying so you can fall in his trap. Amen? So leave men alone and try the spirit. Amen? Try the spirit. What is influencing us as we come up here and teach? What spirit is influencing us as teachers? Amen? Amen? And take your Bible and test that. Don't be afraid of anybody. We're not to be afraid of anybody. There's no fear in God. The only way we're not going to be afraid is if we have confidence and faith in God's word. Amen? Truth fears no one. Amen? So let us continue. So the first thing we see with the prophet is they must be inspired by a spirit. Amen? It's either the Holy Spirit 
a satanic spirit, but it doesn't matter. A spirit must inspire prophets. Amen? Amen. All right. That's what the Bible says. We're following? Okay, so let's go down to our next text. Whom shall he teach what? And whom shall he make to what? Here's what, I, here's what our prophet Miller said. To understand what? Doctrine, bring all the scriptures together on the subject you wish to know. Then let every word have its proper influence. And if you can form your what? Theory without a what? Contradiction, you, 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 me, you cannot be in what? Error. So myself, amen, amen, myself. So I should fear nobody because the Bible stands behind me. Amen. Amen. Go ahead. Every time. Yes. Amen. 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 And what do you do when you receive this understanding? Follow me to the next quote. Let's see what we do. It is the first and highest duty of every rational who being to learn from the scriptures what is error, what is truth, and then, and what? And then to what? Walk in that light and what? Encourage others to follow his what? Example. Keep that in mind. An example is a sign. That's what a sign is. It's an example. And we're going we're gonna to prove that as we go along. A prophet is there to be an example. Amen. We're going we're gonna to prove this. Just follow with me. Walk down with me. Let's go to the next one. Um, go down to the next part of the bowl. It says, with divine what? Help. We are to form our what? Opinions for ourselves as we are to answer for ourselves before God. Did y'all know we're going to have to stand before God and give an answer? We're going to have to answer. That's, that's a fearful time. It's going to be very frightening. We're going to have to stand. God is going to create a crisis, a circumstance. And when we stand before certain, in order to stand before God, what does that mean? Does any, I, I want to, I want to, I'm trying, I'm trying this. This is a conversational study like Romario said. So we have to stand before someone of high authority. Amen. God is going to place somebody in authority that we're going to have to stand before. And standing before him, we're going, God is going to, that authority man, God's spirit is going to be upon him. And God is going to tell that ass to ask us this question. Mm -hmm. And God is, going to put, God is going to put words in that man that we're standing before to ask him this. Ask him that. Y'all follow? Mm -hmm. You can prove this in the Bible. Amen? Yes, Pharaoh. Nebuchadnezzar, and you can go on and on and on, and Cyrus, and, and on and on and on and on. Um, Herod, Herod was asking Christ, who you think was giving Herod those, those questions to ask Christ? Yes, uh, um, Caiaphas, thank you. Yes, amen, and all those people. Who was giving it to him? God was asking this, asking that, and Christ was given the right answer every time. Amen? Y'all follow? All right, this is going to be a fearful time. If we're in God's church, he's going to put us in situations where we're going to have to stand before people. But praise God, he's not going to allow us to come to that time without giving us lessons beforehand. And sometimes we might stand before a boss, a, a, a principal, or your mother, your father, your husband, your wife, your sister. And they ask questions, and we got to be prepared to give the answer for why we believe what we believe. And every time we do it, we're only being prepared for the greater test. Amen? Every time. When you go to um, Exodus and Joseph stands before Pharaoh after coming out of prison, Pharaoh said, <coughs> I'll make you ruler over Egypt, but only in the throne. You will never stand above God. That's what he's teaching. Amen. Only in the throne, I will be higher than God. So God tested Joseph through Pharaoh. Amen. But he let Joseph know, I'm the one testing you. I brought so you, you here. You will never be higher yeah. than me. That's I put you here. Amen. Yeah. Because Pharaoh and Joseph was only a reminder to Satan Amen. and God that Christ put Lucifer at. Christ was telling Lucifer, I put you here. But what did Lucifer say in his heart? I want to be higher than you. Amen. And uh, it, there's so many nice lessons that we can get from that. But let's go back to our thought. So Miller's rule says, bring all the scriptures together, right? So let's look at prophets. Let's look at Deuteronomy. If there arise among you a prophet or a dream of dream and giveth thee a what? Sign or wonder and the sign or the wonder come to pass whereof he spake unto thee saying, let us go after other gods which thou hast not known and let us serve them. 
Thou shalt not hearken unto the words of that prophet or that dream of dream, for the Lord your God, what? So how does God prove people? He sends false prophets. And he makes the false prophet give a sign that comes to pass. But that false prophet, he uses the sign that comes to pass to point you to keep Sunday. Amen? That's what he does. He points you to another God, a God that you, don't, you did not know. God did that to prove you, to see whether you trust visual or auditorial things or you just trust this plain word. What are you going to trust, your sight or are you just going to trust what the word says? Amen. Eve was deceived by her sight. God never made a serpent to talk. So Satan made a talking serpent and he used that sign to convince Eve that there was power in the fruit. And by Eve eating that fruit, she thought she got superhuman power, supernatural power. Isn't that what happened? Mm -hmm. Yes, and she took that supernatural satanic power and deceived her husband. Mm -hmm. Y'all follow? Mm -hmm. So it's the same thing. Satan works the same way. Satan inspired the serpent to speak. Y'all follow? Mm -hmm. The serpent is the false prophet. That's what I, I want us to see. We're going to come more on that as we go along. So let's go down. It said, go ahead. Amen. Thank you. Amen. Eve yield to the evidence of her what? <laughs> There's so much that can be said, and I really want us to understand this. Our condition, our physical fallen condition is all there in Genesis. Because Eve yield to her senses, it's natural for a woman to yield to her senses. Y'all follow? Y'all have a hard time. A woman has a hard time with her senses. Y'all follow? Because Eve did that, that nature is now in every woman. Mm -hmm. Do y'all follow? Mm -hmm. And the only way for that woman to overcome is she has to now abide by the command God gave her. Submit yourself to your husband. Mm -hmm. Because the husband didn't fall to his senses. Mm -hmm. Senses is not the husband's problem. What's his problem? Love. Love is his problem. He had a false understanding of love. He chose Eve over God. He chose Sin over righteousness. Do y'all follow? Mm -hmm. This is why Satan always used women to get men to come to his side because men have a hard time with, with, with looking at a beautiful woman and not going after her. Do y'all follow? Mm -hmm. That nature is in man and that nature is in woman. So the victory for the man, what is it? At the sweat of thy brow, mm -hmm. work. As long as that man is working and his mind is not on the wrong thing. Amen. Y'all follow? Our fallen conditions is right there in Genesis. And, that's, and so the curse, it, the curse that God put up on Adam and Eve was supposed to work out a blessing, actually. And a woman it delivers herself in childbearing. How, a woman, when she makes children, that child is what's going to help that woman to reason better. Y'all follow? Amen. Because by seeing that child, that woman is going to learn reasoning, get her reasoning back that Eve lost. Because Eve listened to the serpent, her reason is confused. And as a result of that, woman struggled with bad reasoning. And that's why the man is there to aid and to help the woman to reason better. Yeah. Amen. Yes, and she's to help the man. Her tender nature is to soften the man, rough and all, that, all, all those things. All that stuff is in the Bible. Amen. All of that is in the Bible. Yes. <laughs> Amen. Yes. Amen. All of these lessons is right there in the Bible if, if, we, if, we, if we take heed to them. And it's not that God is trying to put us down. God just knows that our nature is now corrupt. And he's only trying to heal us. And he's given prophets to help to heal us. Amen. So let's go back to our note. And it says, five, and that prophet or that dream of dreams shall be put to what? Death, why? Because he has spoken to turn you away from the Lord, your what? All right, go down with me to Deuteronomy. The Lord thy God will raise up unto thee a prophet from the what? Midst of thee, of thy brethren, like unto me, unto him shall ye what? Hearken. I have their notes, right? Do y'all see it? What does it say? The Lord will raise up a prophet in the what? Let's look at what Genesis said. Amen. Amen. Let's look at this. Genesis 3, from the mist, the tree of life and the tree of knowledge and good and evil is, it, is, it, um, 
Genesis 3, 3 said, Eve says that the tree of life, knowledge, and good and evil is in the midst of the garden. Mm -hmm. And tree is a man. So in, God, in God's church, until Jesus come, two spirits will be in God's church. The spirit of a true prophet and the spirit of a false prophet. Until Jesus come, it will never leave this church. Y'all follow? Meaning because this garden is the earth, it will never leave. There will always be two spirits. And God says, eat from the tree of life. So God had to put now Christ had to now literally become a man. And that's the tree the whole human family is to eat from until he comes a second time. Amen? Amen. But And the other spirit is always going to speak against that spirit. And it's left up to you and I to discern which one is which. Amen? It's hard to tell, but you, Jesus says you can tell the difference. How? By the fruits. By the fruits you can tell. The tree of life and knowledge and good and evil, it was clear it was a different fruit than what the tree of life was. It was a completely different fruit. Y'all follow the thought, all right? Go ahead. Also, um, we could see the same thing in the midst of our hearts, too. There's yes. Two, two, Amen. Two Romans 7. There's two laws in my memories, Amen. right? Amen. So let's continue. This is also teaching that the tree of life was not common to look at. Because when Eve took from the other tree, <coughs> this, the Bible says, it was beautiful. She saw it was good Amen. for food, which means the tree of life. It didn't look good for food. Even though the Lord says, eat from it. But why did it look good to Eve? Because Satan changed the way of her thinking. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Satan made something that was wrong desirable. Satan made adultery something to be desired. He made stealing something to be desired. He made murder something to be desired. He made making a God before God something to be desired. He made keeping Sunday to be desired more than the Sabbath. Yeah, and now when people do those things, they think it's good for me to commit adultery. It's good for me to kill. It's good for me to steal because our first parents thought that evil was good. Y'all follow? Mm -hmm. So in every one of us, good, what's bad, appeals to us all the time. That's why we fall for every bad thing all the time. So the Lord says the victory over that, crucify the flesh with its affections and lusts. I know that you struggle with those things, but I'm placing before you righteousness, desire this. And if you struggle, I will give you my spirit so that you can work towards that. Amen. Amen. And, and a prophet is raised up to encourage us in the way of righteousness. Amen. And a false prophet is raised up by Satan to discourage us in the way of righteousness. Y'all follow? And that's why the Bible says to the law and to the testimony. If they speak not according to this word, if they don't encourage you to keep the law and the testimony, there's no light in them. A prophet always encourages us to keep God's law and his testimonies every single time. They never turn you away from the right way. Amen? Never. That's what Deuteronomy says. They turn you out of the right way. That's not a true prophet. Yep. Amen? All right, so let's continue. Go ahead. Amen. You'll never be wrong. Amen. Never be wrong. Yes, yes, that's exactly what we're But who inspired that? Satan. Satan. Satan put his spirit into her. Yeah. And hold on, I won't cut you. And because of that, we struggle with self-exaltation. Because our first mother received the spirit of self-exaltation in all of us, that's why we want to wear jewelry. That's why we want to wear this clothes instead of what the Lord says to wear. Because we constantly, our heart constantly wants to rise above God. Because our mother accepted that spirit, so therefore every one of us that's born into the human family, we have that spirit. And Jesus came and crucified that spirit and left us a better spirit, one that doesn't desire exaltation, but desire God's righteousness. Amen? But it's by choice. We have to choose Jesus' spirit by choice and be willing to kill that desire of loving movies, of loving movies that God doesn't approve of, listening to songs that he doesn't approve of, Talking to people that leads you away from God, God doesn't approve of that. Eve went to talk to a serpent, a tree, God doesn't approve of that. So we shouldn't have communications with people that's going to lead us away from God. Amen? All of that is right there in the beginning in, in, in Genesis. Sorry, Michelle, go ahead. I just have to include that. Sorry. 
So where's the happiness of a wife? Amen. Amen. Struggle is a struggle for women. Yeah. But because as Christians, as husbands, husband, I'm speaking to the husbands, because as husbands we know that a wife struggle with that, we should be tender and compassionate with them. Amen? And wives, because your husband is rough and he doesn't know how to be tender and compassionate, we should be, gen- we should be patient with him and influence that softer side of his nature because we know he doesn't naturally have that. Amen? And so in that, we encourage one another in a marital relationship. She fell far below it. Amen. And that's why she had to sub- submit herself to her. Amen. Amen. But I want us to see God is not doing that for, to be mean to Eve. God just knows that there's a, there's a nature now that Eve took on that's always going to claim rise that wants to go high. So in order to help women from that point on, God says, woman, submit yourself to your husband. It's to help you. And the husband is supposed to not dominate over her because he has this. No, that's not what he does. He's supposed to encourage and tend to listen to her, take advice from her at times, listen to some of her reasoning, and, and try to work with us best as he can. Amen? By, yes. Amen. Encourage. That's what, because like Swinon said, that's what Christ did with his church. Amen. Christ knew that we struggle with fight and sin, so he's patient with us, long-suffering with us, merciful with us, eat ready to forgive us, ready to deal with us, ready to caress us and walk us through. Amen. Go ahead. Um, um, Quickly. Okay, so Rick, Eve became the same spirit as Satan in that she wanted to exalt herself and she was brought lower than she already was. So That's Satan's going to be brought lower. Right, Satan's going to be brought lower. Amen. And you're saying that that isn't just a new thing that God is doing, and I agree because God's law in a large sense is about balance, and you can see that in nature. So um, to offset the, the want to, um, to go higher than you're supposed to be, he makes you lower. Amen. So that resultantly you're where you were supposed to be in the first place. Amen. So it's basically bringing you back to what you should have been. Right. Yeah, amen. Uh, that's nice. He only brings you up in proportion. Amen. Sacrifice. Amen. amen. So let us go back to our note. I, I want to let's switch back to the notes. Amen. But all the thoughts were, is in line with, the, with what we're going over. Amen. So it says, Deuteronomy. It's a, God says he's going to raise up a prophet, right? Amen. And he says, I'm going to bring him up out of your midst. Listen, go to verse 18. This is the part. Uh, the, I missed so much, but it's okay. I will raise them up a prophet from among their brethren, like unto thee, and will put my words where? So, so a prophet is someone, the Holy Spirit puts words in the prophet's mouth. And God says, I raise them up from your brethren. So a prophet must always come from amongst us. Can't be from without the church. It must be from amongst us. Amen? They're, that's a rule. So if they come from without, like if a Sunday church person, we nonsense. They must be from amongst us. Amen? So all right, let's go on. It says, and he shall speak unto them all that I shall command him. And it shall come to pass that whosoever will not hearken unto my words, which he shall speak in my name, I will require it of him. But the prophet which shall presume to speak a word in my name, which I have not commanded him to speak, or that shall speak in the name of other gods, even that prophet shall die. All right. Now, let's see how this was fulfilled, because the prophet that, that mo- that's to be raised up was who? Christ. But I want us to see that this is every prophet. Every prophet he raised up was a type of Christ. Every single one of them. Jonah, Isaiah, Ezekiel, Jeremiah, Daniel, they were all types of Christ. But, they, but the true prophet, like Swinon said in Romero, the true prophet, the highest prophet, the chief prophet is Jesus Christ himself. Amen? Because he wasn't just, it wasn't just the spirit of God in Christ, it was God himself. It was God in the man Christ Jesus that made him chief prophet. Amen? And him, 
Every prophet is to bow the knee and to hear his words. Amen? So let us go back. Deuteronomy now. The Lord talked with you face to face in a mount out of the midst of the what? Fire. Fire. Man, I wish I had time to go through all of this. How did God talk to Moses? No, no, no. Yes. The burning, the burning bush. So what was God making Moses? So what did God want to do with Israel at Mount Sinai? But they denied it. They said, no, no, I, 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 don't, I don't let Moses speak to us. Amen. That's what they, God was trying to put the spirit that was in Moses upon them. And they didn't want it. And so said, God said, okay, from now on, I'll just keep speaking through Moses. God wanted to just speak to them directly instead of always through Moses. Y'all follow? That's, he was doing the same thing. But Israel didn't want it. Praise, praise God that Moses wanted it. So God now have to send Christ. Because we don't want to come to his Bible, he always have to send a prophet to us because people always refuse to come to his Bible. They, always. We always run from his voice. So this is why he always have to keep using prophets. Because that's our carnal disgust in heart. Amen? So let us go back. It says, but praise God, there are some people who are like Moses that don't run from the burning bush. They don't run from hearing God's voice. Instead, they fall on their faces. Amen. They humble themselves and God picked them up. What are they doing? They're doing what God told Eve because the, Moses is the church. And Eve, Moses falling on her face is a sign that Eve should fall on her face to her husband. Amen. That's, that's what it's teaching. All of, it's the same lesson over and over again. But let us continue. Verse 5. I stood between the Lord and you at that time to show you the word of the Lord. So a prophet stands between God and the people. Amen. That's what he does to show us the what? The word of the Lord. Because you didn't want to hear it from his mouth, so he gave you a prophet. Amen. Amen. So let us continue. Next, let's go down now. Acts. For Moses truly said unto the fathers, A prophet shall the Lord your God raise up unto you of your brethren, like unto me. Him shall ye hear in all things, whatsoever he shall say unto you. And it shall come to pass that every soul which will not hear that prophet shall be what? Destroyed from among the people. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him shall not be destroyed. Amen. Amen. Whoever believes in Christ, that's the prophet that God has raised up. And whoever believes in him shall not be destroyed. But if anyone speaks against him, woe be to that man. Amen. All right. So let's look, look back. Deuteronomy 18. And if thou say, I love this part now. This is where we come into this, to the meat of things. And if thou say in thine heart, how shall we know the word which the Lord hath not spoken? This is important now from this point on because this is, this is everyone's problem, literally. How do we know that God used Jeff? How do we know that God used Swindon? How do we know that God used Mark? I'm not talking about the past. I'm talking about the present. How do we know whom God is using? How, how do we know? This is giving us the answer. Y'all following? Let's look at the answer. When a prophet or a teacher speaketh in the name of the Lord, if the thing follow not, nor come to pass, that is the thing which the Lord hath not what? Spoken. But the prophet hath spoken it presumptuously. Thou shalt not be what? Afraid of him. Notice that. I have a note there, right? I want us to see some. Thou shalt not be afraid, right? So if it comes to pass, what should we be? terribly afraid y'all follow if what that prophet say come to pass we should be afraid so let, let's look at number 7 12 7 to 8 my servant Moses is not so who is faithful in all my house with him will I speak mouth to mouth even apparently and not in dark speeches and the similitude of the Lord shall shall he behold wherefore then were you not what afraid to speak against my servant Moses Amen. Amen. And what I'm trying to get to is that we're saying something is going to happen here, right? Some prediction is going to come to pass here that we're going to prophesy well in advance of it. And when this thing comes to pass, it's a sign. And if we don't fear the message that's being taught by the people that God is putting his words in their mouth, then there's a terrible judgment that's going to come upon that people. The Bible says they shall surely die. Amen. And all of that is going to be a sign. That's what, that's what I really want to get to. The Lord is teaching us things, 
We're going to give a prophetic thing of what's going to happen here. And he's given us a faint view of this right where we mark Biden, where Daniel 11.3 was fulfilled. We, we said that that was going to happen. And we should have given it well in advance. We should have. But because we are hard of learning, it, it's taking us time to understand these things. And God knows that, so he's patient with us. But before Biden became president, the Lord opened up Daniel 11.3. And that was designed to convince us that God is really teaching us. And that he said Biden was going to be president, but there was a false teaching in the movement saying Trump was going to be the last president. Do we remember that? There was this false teaching, and people had to now make this decision, and the Lord put Biden in place. How do I know the Lord put Biden in place? Daniel 2 tells me that. It's God that sets up kings, and he takes down king. The Lord took down Trump, and he set up Biden. I don't care if Biden got in there through, through fraud. The Lord put false murders in there through fraud. So it's teaching me that the Lord sometimes will allow fraud to bear sway for a time. Because the Ecclesiastes 3 tells me that he has a purpose. And what is his purpose? He wants to do something. He wants to raise a certain people up so that the world know that there's a people in the earth that understands the Bible. Amen? That's what he's doing. Fraud has been allowed for 6,000 years. Yes, yes. That's nice. Amen. Amen. So let's go back. Sign. So, so Christ, so remember, Deuteronomy 18 says, the prophet that God sends, he must give the people a sign. And if the sign comes to pass, you better fear that prophet. So Jesus had to give, so God then has to give the most powerful and convincing sign that nobody can't counterfeit. And the sign that Satan can never, not in a million years, can he ever counterfeit is resurrection. Y'all follow? He can't, he doesn't have the power to, to make something inanimate living. Y'all follow? He can't make the dead really speak. He can't do that. He can't turn a rod into a serpent. But however, he can trick the mind to make you think that the dead is speaking. Y'all follow? He can trick the mind, but God doesn't play trickery. God is real. God really rose Christ from the dead, and the resurrection is the strongest evidence that Jesus is God. Amen? But, but it's also the death and the resurrection, because it takes a lot of power to be ridiculed and mocked and spit upon and punched in the face and slapped and cursed at and still stay there silent. It takes a lot of power not to react. To, to, to people doing bad things to us. It takes a lot of power to resist that. So Jesus' death is a sign. Satan can't do that either. God knows how to provoke Satan and make him angry. Y'all follow? But Satan can't make God angry. He's patient. God is long-suffering. How can, who? Isaiah 7 said, will man weary God? You can't weary God. God can suffer as long as he really wants to. Because how, why is that? Because he knows there's nothing higher than him. What is he afraid of? Go ahead. He died. It'll probably come back. But it, is everyone following? Okay. Okay. Yes, amen. Every time Satan kills a prophet, the Lord raises up another, another one. one Stephen to Paul. And amen. since Ellen White, he has killed that prophet. Amen. And now it, the, the Lord is waiting to resurrect that spirit. Prophet. Yeah, he's trying to bring back that spirit. Amen. So now I want to see, let's see the sign that Jesus gave. Because Deuteronomy 18 says, if the prophet give you a sign, it must follow the past. And this is how you're going to know that that prophet was sent by God. Amen. amen. So let's look at John. Then answered the Jews and said unto him, What sign showest thou? Why do you think they're asking this? Because they know a prophet must always give a sign. They know that. that that's what the Lord told. Jesus came and Jesus, they said, the, the Bible, um, the disciples were teaching that Jesus was a prophet. So the Jews came and said, Okay, what sign are you going to show us to make us know that you're a prophet? Because the Bible says the Lord, the Lord, when the Lord sends a prophet, they must give you a sign. They understood this. And this is what, what do we, notice what the Lord is doing. What are we teaching right now? A sign. So what is he telling us? He's about to raise up prophets. Because we're about to give people a sign. We're about to prophesy something so powerful that's going to come to pass. And man, if people don't fear this thing that comes to pass, like, like we said, woe unto that person. Amen. The Lord is going to make something powerful come to pass in all of our sight 
based upon the foundation of his word. And I'm, let's look at, let's see that this is, every sign must be based upon the Bible. Every sign in the spirit of prophecy. Let's look at this. Then answered the Jews and said unto them, What sign showest thou unto us, seeing that thou doest these things? Jesus answered and said unto them, Destroy what? This temple, and in three days I will what? The Lord thy God will raise up a prophet in thy midst. Y'all follow? And Jesus says, destroy the temple. They got to do one thing, destroy it. And in three days, the Lord will raise up a prophet. Amen? Y'all follow? All right, so let's go back. Then certain of the scribes and of the Pharisees answered, saying, Master, we would see what? A sign from thee. But he answered and said unto them, An evil and an adulterous generation seeketh after a sign, and there shall no sign be given it, but the sign of the prophet who? Jonas. And I have a note there, to, only for this point. The prophet is a sign. Because it says the sign of the prophet, Jonas. So the prophet, every prophet is a sign. Amen? All right. Yes, amen. Because they have the spirit of inspiration. They have life. All right, so let's go back. I, I really want us to get this because this is very important because we're going to be tested on these things. Amen? Prophecy, we're going to be tested on the spirit of prophecy. We really are. That's what the book of Revelation is all about, the spirit of prophecy, the prophecy of this book. Amen? And if we don't know how to test the spirits of people, not just what they teach, but the spirit behind the person, it's two things we got to test, what they teach and the spirit influencing them. And if we don't know how the Holy Spirit works, we're really going to be deceived. Amen? We need to know how the Holy Spirit works. It's, it's, it's very serious. I can't wait for the day the Lord really shows people how serious salvation really is. I really can't wait for it. I can't wait for it because a lot of people is not taking salvation seriously. And I can't wait for the day the Lord puts the fear of God back in people's heart to show us that salvation is serious. We are on enchanted ground. It's serious times we're living in. And the vi it's, it's amazing to me. The virus, look at the whole world. The whole world is literally have to make a decision between the vaccine and no vaccine. We have never seen that in the history of our time. Never. And God designed this to impress upon people that our lives are at stake. And yet people still want to go party. They still want to go do all of these things and can't see that things is falling apart around them. It amazes me. It really, it really amazes me. So, and what is the Lord trying to do? Put the fear of God back into people's heart. And that's why we're going to give a powerful message that's going to have that kind of effect upon people. But at the same time, Satan is going to raise up a false prophet to say, thou shalt not surely die. At the same time. Amen. Even though God is going to have this come to pass, the Jews is still going to say, what are they going to say? Say that the disciples stole him away to bury the sign of the resurrection. Yeah, so at the end, even though the Lord is going to do the resurrection, a false prophet is going to be there, say that the disciples stole away the body. That's why he's not in the grave. And foolish people is going to believe that over the word of God. Foolish people is going to believe that lie that people is going to tell them to turn them away from this powerful sign that the Lord is going to do there. Amen. Yeah, it's, it's terrible. Amen. And now the Lord is going to bring a worse judgment after that. He's going to bring something even more terrible than this point. But for right now, the Lord just have us focus us on this because we just need to make it there. Amen. We just need to make it there. And by the grace of God, we will if we if we remain faithful. I'm not trying to scare anybody. I just want to see it's really serious. It's 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 really life or death. It has always been life or death. There's never been a time it hasn't been life or death. And I just pray to God that one day it will really snap in our minds that it's really serious. What's happening in the world is designed to teach people that our lives are at stake. But unfortunately, unfortunately, many people are still going on as though nothing is not really happening. They're still living as though not. I mean, look at the world. The whole world is on lockdown. I don't know what more people need to, to see that the, the Bible, God is trying to call people. I don't know what more the Lord can do in it. Ter yeah, because Satan is, yes, oh man, it's terrible. So let's go back to our note. First says, for as Jonah's what? As for as Jonah's, y'all there? Was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so what? Okay, so was and shall is a sign. What's was? 
Past. And what shall? Future. Future. Yes, amen. That's present. Because Jesus says, a greater than Jonah's is here. Amen. So I just want to see that past, present, and future are signs. So Jesus says, as Jonah's was, death, so shall resurrection. Amen. Amen. All right. So that's what he's saying. And he says, that's the only sign I'm giving you, the death and the resurrection. That's all you're getting. Amen. But he pointed them to a story to impress upon their mind that that story is pointing to that event. So I want us to see this. Go down. So now go to Ezekiel 12. Say, I am your what? Sign, like as I have done, so shall it be done. Isn't that plain? So what is a sign? What God has done, so shall it be done. That's it. Amen. So God put Jonah in the belly, so Christ is going to go in the belly. God took Jonah out of the belly, so Christ is going to come out of the grave. Christ had so much assurance going to his experience. He knew he was going to rise again. Amen. Because he had all that evidence before him. So, too, we must have the assurance that God is going to do this work. Amen? Amen. And we must exercise the same faith and confidence that the Lord really is going to bring this event to pass. So the Lord is going to show us something powerful that's based upon the past. Amen? Amen. He's going to show us something former, pointing to the latter. But at the same time, it's happening in the present. Amen? Amen? At the same time, to give us confidence to go forward. Amen? Amen. But what I want us to see, Jesus took Jonah and he gave it an interpretation for his time. So God is going to show us something in the scripture and we're going to interpret it for our time. And this is where people like Romario said struggle. Because now they say God did not show you that. Well, the Lord says, okay, I'm going to bring it to pass. And that's why the Lord doesn't cut people off right away, because this present truth really hasn't been established yet. So he doesn't really cut people off. But once he does this work, that's it. You don't. Yeah. No more. Huh? That's why they keep putting it in the future. Yeah. They take the thing of the past and they see nothing now. Amen. And they keep putting it in the future. Amen. Go ahead. destroying the temple by bringing in unholy traffic. Yes. So Christ came at that time, and that event in itself was the sign. But they yes, amen. Yes. They kept asking for a sign. Yeah. Because I wanted to put that in there, but I thought it was going to be too long. Because you can go to John 2, where it says, and the disciples remembered that it had been written. Yes. So I, I wanted to put it in there. I'm like, oh, man, I don't know if I'm going to have enough time to go. But I'm glad you saw that. I'm glad you did. I, I, it, that shows me that you're following Amen. So I praise God. So I really pray that we're all really following that we're because this is important for us to understand. Amen. Because Satan is also going to give a sign. Amen. The papacy is his sign. Y'all follow. That's his sign. And the whole world is going to wander after that sign. You know why? Because the God, Satan is going to make Protestants and the papacy do so much powerful miracles before people's eyes and taking the Bible as their foundation for what they are doing. And God is going to have people to contest that evil that is going, it's really going to be hard for people. I mean, it's really going to be hard. And God really wants us to discern to the spirits that are working behind these people. Amen? He really wants us to understand that a lot of Adventists think because they keep the Sabbath and people keep Sunday that they're safe. It's, it's, it's more than that. They're really going to come with doctrinal things and Bible things. Just, just think about what Rome has hidden in their vault. Think about that. How many manuscripts and, and artifacts that they have locked up in papers. Some of it is going to be true, and some of it is going to be false. And it's going gonna, it's gonna to try people to the core, because the Bible says, Jesus says, if possible, it would deceive the very elects. But praise God, it's not possible. Why is it not possible? Because Jesus wasn't deceived. Because he wasn't deceived, he's our sign that some people are not going to be deceived. Amen? Amen. Go ahead. Amen. Amen. Christ saw through the deception. So, so let us continue now. Let's, let's look at the sign one more, the former things. 
Men and brethren, let me freely speak unto you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried, and his sepulchre is with us unto this day. I love this. This is the strongest evidence for the state of the dead. Amen? Well, let's go on. Therefore, being a what? Prophet, and knowing that God had, had sworn with an oath to him, that of the fruit of his loins, according to the flesh, he would what? Raise up Christ. Deuteronomy 18. He would raise up Christ to sit on his throne. He seeing this before. So what does a prophet do? He sees before. Amen. Every prophet always sees before. He seeing before spake of the resurrection of Christ. So David was speaking about the death and resurrection. He, the Bible says David saw it. David understood that. But it's weird that the Jews didn't understand this. But David understood it. They had a prophet David in their midst that told them that Christ was going to die and raise again, but they didn't get it. So Peter had to now come and re-educate them. Amen. So he says, before spake of the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left where? In hell, neither his flesh did see corruption. This Jesus hath God what? Deuteronomy 18. Amen. So jump down with me to 36. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus whom ye have crucified destroy this temple. That's what Peter's only recalling them to the sign Jesus gave them. Whom you have destroyed, both Lord and Christ. Now when they heard this, they were what? Pricked to their heart and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? What does prophecy make people do? Repent. Amen. It makes people want to worship God. Praise God. So now let's go to the first sign. I love this part when I, and I, when, when I was going through this. I just want us to follow this. Look at this real quick. And Moses answered, hold on, before I do that, how many signs did Jesus really point to when he says, this, um, when they asked for a sign? Two. He says the destruction and the what? The resurrection. He did say the preaching, but the two he really wanted them to focus on was what? The death and the resurrection. The strongest evidence to the truth is the cross. Is the death and the resurrection. This is the sign that God gave to man. Because this is what Romario said, read. Y'all remember? The Lord himself will do what? Give you a sign. And Jesus says, no sign shall be given you, but the sign of who? Jonas. The Lord gave them that sign. Not just the Jews, to all mankind. For all mankind, the sign is the birth of Christ, which is the death and the resurrection. The birth of Christ. Amen. That's the sign. That's the sign that, that the Lord has given to us. Go ahead. Amen. The two signs. Amen. That's nice. Amen. 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 And then the rest makes the resurrection more powerful. Amen. Because it shows that, yes, he died, and he stayed a whole day in the grave for them to know that I did die. Amen. And then he came out on the other side so that they know that I came from there. Amen. So the, 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 all three, but like you said, the two that speaks loudest is the death and the resurrection. And the resurrection. Amen. Because the only ones that will see the other ones is those that accept the death. Yeah. Because those who accept the death will rest and they'll be resurrected. But if they don't, if the sign, so the Lord is going to show us a sign in here, which is the former things, this. The former things is going to shine with so much glory in here. But we're already getting a few out here. Amen? So he's going to so much light, not on just what happened in the past, but what's going to happen in the future. I mean, he's going to pour out so much light, not only what's going to happen in the future, but also what's happening in the present. Amen? Amen? He's going to do the same thing. Because the things that's happening in the future is ha already happening right now. Yeah, they're already happening. That's why we can see the coronavirus predicted in the Bible. It is there. Amen. It is there. But we just need to have our eyes anointed so that we can in read the signs of the times. Amen. So let's go back. I'm going to close out on this thought. Moses, two signs, right? It says, and Moses answered and said, but behold, they will not what? Believe me, nor hearken unto my voice, for they will say, the Lord hath not appeared unto thee. That's what people are saying now. Okay, so it says, and the Lord said unto him, what is that in thine hand? And he said, a what? So what's in our hand? What's in our hand? What's the rod? What's the rod? The Bible. Thank you. Amen. Yes. Amen. Amen. Yes. Yes. Yeah, that's nice. 
So the Bible, our rod, is the Bible, the spirit of prophecy, all these, the commandments, they're all the rod. Amen? Amen. The word of God is the rod. Amen? Amen. So let's go back. So I, I, there's a reason why I'm saying this. Look at this. What is that in thine hand? So what is in our hand? The third angel's message. Amen. That's the rod. That's, so I'm, I should put that here because Protestants use the Bible. But the third angel's message is, what's, is what the Lord is going to magnify above what the Protestants is, Protestants is doing. Amen. Amen? So it says, the third angel's message, Revelation chapter 11, God gave him a reed like onto a rod. That's what he gave to the church. Uh, I don't have time to really go through those. But going back, so God says, and he says, cast it on the ground. And he cast it on the ground, and it became a what? And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. God cast Christ to the ground, and Christ became flesh. Amen? That was the first sign that God gave to the Jewish nation. The Lord himself shall give you a sign. <laughs> Moses is teaching them that sign. Y'all follow? I really want y'all to see that. Do y'all follow? Mm -hmm. Yes. Was, Go ahead. The first sign that Christ died. Amen. He was cast to the ground. Yes. Amen. Falls into the ground and died. Amen. That's why I said the birth and the death is the same. Yeah. It's one and the same. I really want us to see this. Mo that rod that Moses had was the word of God. And God used Moses to illustrate to us how he was going to send his son and his son was going to become flesh. The word was going to manifest before people's eyes like the serpent manifest before Moses' eyes. Amen? Amen. Christ was going to come in sinful flesh. That's what the serpent was illustrating. Amen. That one day Christ was going to come in sinful flesh. So the Jews already had a sign. Amen? Amen. But Moses did two signs because he says, okay, if they don't believe the birth, then they'll believe the death. Amen. Since they don't believe the birth, they'll believe the death. So he gave them a second sign. Amen. Well, I want us to see something. What happened when Moses saw the serpent? Let's go down. And Moses fled from before it. He came on to his own and his own fled from before him. Amen. The Jews fled from before him. But what did Moses do after he fled? So, and many that believe him, to them he gave power. Moses repented. And so there's a class that's going to repent. Amen. And they're going to, amen, and come back in. Y'all follow? Amen. The Bible is really beautiful. It's really a nice thing. So let's, let's look at the second sign, because Moses is two that God gave him. There was a third one, if they don't believe that one. The third one, Swinon had gone over this, is with 70 AD, the destruction of Jerusalem. That was the last and final sign. Amen? But we want to look at the second one. Let's go back. And the Lord said furthermore unto him, Put now thy hand into thy bosom. And he put his hand into his bosom. And when he took it out, Behold, his hand was leprous as snow. What's the hand? Jesus was God's helping hand. And God put his hand in the bosom in Gethsemane. And he put all the sins of the world upon Christ. Christ became leprous. Amen? Y'all follow? And Christ is going to go in the bosom of the grave. But how is he going to come out? Clean, white as snow. Y'all follow? That's, that's the two signs. That he gave them. Those are two signs. Go ahead. Also, when someone has that, that, um, that, um, yeah, 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 amen. When someone has that, they have to be separate from men. So oh, like, praise yeah. God. Yes. A God. Yes, yes. God amen. Ah, uh, praise God. I have it in there. Uh, <laughs> amen. Yeah, yeah, uh, praise God. Same spirit. Amen. Same God. spirit. Amen. amen. Praise God. I, I might not have time. Because he brought him into the earth, he became leprous. That was the cross. Yes. But he put him in the earth after the cross. So he put him back in. And when the hand came out, then the hand was whole. That's Christ's resurrection. Amen. So he came in the earth twice. <coughs> once as a baby. Yes, amen. Once that is dead. Yes, amen. Twice yes, yes. Amen. amen. Sinful flesh. Yeah, amen. He comes out whole. Amen. It's, it's really nice. The whole Bible is like this. Amen. So what to Romario said, go down with me now, jump over that. Since we got that, 2 Corinthians says, for he had made him to be what? Sin for us. That's him becoming leprous. Amen. And then he was put into the grave and he came out whole. Amen. So let's go back. Of all diseases known in the East, the leprosy was most dreaded. It's, in, it's incurable and contagious character and its horrible effect had it, had, and its horrible effect upon his victims filled the bravest with fear among the Jews, it was regarded as a, as a judgment on account of sin, and hence was called a stroke, the finger of God. That's what the cross was, the finger of God. So it says, 
This is what Satan can't counterfeit, the death and the resurrection. Amen? He can't counterfeit the death and the resurrection. Well, let us go on. Deep-rooted, irreducible. Ir ir I can't say that word. Ineradicable. Thank you. Ineradicable, deadly. It was looked upon as a symbol of what? Sin. By the ritual law, the laborers pronounced the labor, the leper was pronounced unclean, like one already dead. He was shut out from the habitations of men. Christ was shut out. Amen. Amen. And it says, whatever he touched was unclean. The air was polluted by his breath. One who was suspected Christ taking on sin, God was showing what he's going to do to sin. He has to destroy it. He has to cover it. He has to hide it so that we won't be polluted by it. Amen. That's what he's going to do to Satan and all those wicked people that choose to worship at Satan's feet. Amen. Christ was a sign to what God is going to do to sin and sinners. He's going to bury them out of his sight. Amen. And they'll never rise again. That's why Christ left his garment in the grave to show that sin will never, ever come out of that grave that God is going to put it in. Amen. That's why he left it there. So let's go back. It says, the air was polluted by his breath. One who was suspected of having the disease must present himself to the priest. Didn't Christ do that? Yeah. He went before Caiaphas and Annas. He presented himself. Mm -hmm. Then it says, who were to examine and decide his case? Pilate, Herod, Caiaphas. They were examining and deciding his case. Yeah. Christ was worthy of death. He had, yeah. amen. And they, and they put him without the camp. Yeah. Amen. So it says, if pronounced a leper, he was isolated from his family, cut off from the congregation of Israel, and was doomed to associate with those only who were similarly affected, the two thieves on the cross. Amen. Yes, amen. Yes, yes, yes. So uh, that's, that's all I wanted to see from that. Amen. All of that is how we're going to know who a prophet is. They're going to take things like this, the Bible, and they're going to give it a... Uh, interpretation for their time and they're going to use it to point to something that's going to come and when it comes to pass him shall you hear amen that's how we're going to understand who a true prophet is from a false prophet and it's one thing to hear people speak the truth many people can come and say Jesus is savior but what spirit in influenced them to say that what spirit influenced them to say that the Pope will tell you Jesus is savior but does he really believe in Jesus why, do we, why can we say that? Because he says worship on Sunday. He tells you to go serve another God. Yeah. Amen. So we don't follow that dreamer of dream or that prophet. The Bible says he's going to really die. Amen. It's just in God's time when that prophet is going, that false prophet is going to die. So I'm going to close out here. I don't want to go any longer. Just, uh, just this nice thought um, for sign. Jesus says there's going to be many false prophets, right? Mm -hmm. And I really wish I had time to go through that, but you can read it on your own in Numbers. It says, many false prophets is going to come. And when you go to Numbers, God sent fiery serpents. Those were the false prophets. But why did they come? Because the people murmured. So why do false prophets always come into the church? Because we're murmuring. We're complaining against the manna. That's what they were complaining against. They don't like the bread that they were eating. Amen. For 40 years, remember this, for 40 years, they ate the same thing for 40 years and drank the same water. So how does God reveal wicked people? By feeding them the same lesson again and again and again and again. And eventually, some people are going to come and they're going to say, I am sick and tired of lying up online. I'm sick and tired of here a little, there a little. I'm sick and tired of this and that. Is that this way, Mark? Is that that way, Mark? So you know what God is going to do because you're sick and tired? Send false prophets. Y'all follow? That's what Israel is there to teach us. If you don't like these things, he's going to send a prophet that has the food that you like. Yes, and he's going to make that prophet take you out of his camp. Amen? Yes, amen, because he's going to come with exactly what you want. Amen. And I want to I want to end by this. Um, what are some of our favorite food? Your personal favorite food? Pizza, Sugar, man. apple, lentils. You said lentils. Oh, tofu. OK, your favorite food and pomegranate. So those are some of your favorite food, right? Mango. Mango. So those are your favorite food. OK. Um, apple. 
Apple. Apple's your favorite food, right? Yeah. And how often do y'all like to eat y'all favorite food? Every day. Every day, right? Yeah. Because y'all enjoy it, right? And y'all have delight in that favorite food, right? And because you have delight in that favorite food, y'all eat it constantly. You don't, it don't even matter if you, if you eat it five days in a row. So why didn't they like the manna? They didn't delight it in it. They didn't make it their favorite food. God tried to remove their favorite food from them and give them a new diet. Amen? Yes, their favorite food was the leeks and the onions. So God wanted to give them a new taste bud. He wanted to heal their taste bud. So the Lord is teaching us something helpful. To heal our taste buds, we need to stop eating what we're used to eating and eat something different so to give our taste bud time to heal. Amen? That's what the Lord was doing. Their taste bud was corrupt. How do I know this? Because when Eve saw that the tree was good for food, she changed her taste bud. So God has to undo that nonsense that's in our DNA and give us heavenly food. That's Amen? Why, that's why it took 40 years. It took that long if, to change the taste had, bud. Amen. The it would have been changed. Yes. Amen. And the honey. Amen. But they were unwilling to change their yeah. taste bud. So you see why I asked you guys? I gave y'all a little parable, a prophecy, the parable, I mean, a figurative. All y'all favorite foods, y'all are willing to eat it. So why won't we eat the word of God? Why won't we eat it? That means you don't delight in it. That's what you're really saying. Whenever you don't study, you're saying you don't delight in the word of God. That's what you're saying. And God reads your heart and he sees it. Because how is it you can eat your favorite food naturally, but you claim to love Jesus, but won't eat the spiritual food? Y'all follow? That's how God rebukes us. That's why he gives us the natural things, because we delight in the natural things, but we show little delight in the spiritual things. And we, what are we doing? Repeating the same sin of Israel. Amen. That's what we're doing. And we need to overcome that spirit. It's an evil spirit. It's evil. And, and I want to read a text that proves this. Go with me to Jeremiah. I'm going to close out. Jeremiah 6. Jeremiah 6, right? It said, I want us to go there. Go with me to Jeremiah 6, and then on that thought, Jeremiah 6. It says, to whom shall I speak and give warning that they, verse 10, I'm sorry, Jeremiah 6, 10. To whom shall I speak? This is what a prophet is going to do. To whom shall I speak and give warning that they may what? That they may what? Hear, behold, their ear is what? Uncircumcised, and they cannot what? Hearken, behold, the word of the Lord is unto them a reproach. They have no delight in it. That's why people don't want to hear these things. They have no delight in it. Whenever we don't want to hear these things, we're only saying we don't delight it. So you know what the Lord is going to do? Resurrect like Swindon said the old path. And the old path is what's going to decide who has delight in it. Yeah. See, and ask for the old fat. Amen. What is God trying to do? Heal their taste buds. The old path is what heals our taste buds. Amen. That's what the manna was. The Lord was trying to heal them. So I end by saying this. If we delight in mango and tofu and this fruit and that fruit, why don't we delight in the word of God? Amen. If we delight in the natural things, Jesus said to us, man shall not live by these things and we delight in alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Amen. We should have delight in spiritual things as well. And if we don't delight in it, praise God, confess that sin and say, Lord, I don't delight in your word. I honestly don't. I really don't. But David said, restore unto me the joy of thy Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right delight in me. Amen. And restore unto me the joy of thy salvation, and then I will have delight in the Lord. Amen. So if we don't delight in God's word, don't, be, don't feel down. Confess it. Say, Lord, I really didn't delight in your word. I really don't. I honestly, Lord, don't delight in your word. Please give me a hungering and a thirsting spirit for your word. Confess that sin. Confess it. Amen. Uphold me with thy free spirit. Amen. Go ahead. Amen. 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 Amen.
do it, eventually they will walk into a situation where you know, if a guy is you know, a guy is not so tall and he or you know, he knows your heart, he lets you love it, that he'll show you'll be able to love it that way even more than he will Amen. be able to take it off for you. Amen. 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 It will. And I want to say something that Swindon said earlier. You know how long it really takes to form a habit? 40 days. Because that's what Israel teaches us. Amen. If you just do that for 40 days, morning and evening, eventually it will become a habit. But the Lord don't want us to, to do it because of form. Amen. He wants us to do it because we delight in it. But it's okay. We don't delight in it right away. Well, the first thing you do, Ellen White says, form a good habit. Make it a habit. And then over time, eventually you're going to start developing a love for it. Amen? The longer you keep doing it. So there's nothing wrong with developing a habit, but we don't want it to just be a form. We really want to love doing it. And that's why we got to ask the Lord to restore, give me that desire because we don't naturally have it. It's a gift that comes from him. Amen. It's Christ's spirit that he gives to us, but we're not going to get it unless we ask for it. And we, and we have to really desire it. And he does give it to us. And when he gives it to us, exercise it. Don't quench it. Don't let it die out by not actually doing it. Sometimes we get a desire to read and to study and we don't act upon it and it dies out. And now the Lord has to send a stronger desire. That's just the hunger pangs that you feel. Amen? That's all it is. It's the hunger pangs. You're hungry, you eat. So when the Lord puts a desire to study, that's your hunger. Your, hung your spirit is now hungry. Go eat then. Amen? Go and eat. You do it naturally, right? So do the same thing spiritually. Amen? So let us close out with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, we want to thank you there, Lord, for your word. It really is able to make us wise unto salvation. But, Lord, uh, one of the most fearful things, O oh Lord, is that we can understand all of these things and yet fail to hit the mark. Lord, without Christ, we can't do anything. So please, O oh Lord, may you really create in us a clean heart and renew a right spirit within us. Please make us willing to do those things that please you. They don't come natural to us. Our first parents took on a nature that, that's foreign to you. But, Lord, Christ came to heal us of that nature and to remove the curse from, from the earth and from our hearts. And, Lord, he's only going to do it for those that are willing to let him do it. So please help us to be willing to allow you to do this work for us and help us, O oh Lord. Teach us how to discern, how to try the Spirit, how to really know when you're using people because you use men. You became a man to teach us that you're using men. And Lord, you left it up to us to discern the Spirit, the power working behind the men you use. So please help us to learn to discern this so that we don't find ourselves fighting against the very people you're using to teach your message at the end of the world. Please forgive us of our sins of neglect of prayer and Bible study, and studying in the manner in which we should. I pray, O oh Lord, as this new year began, may you help us to begin a new life in studying your word daily, not, not, not letting a day pass without studying your word. Please give us that spirit and des that desire, but at the same time, give us a delight to do it. And we ask all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.